Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. Welcome into this loving community of seekers who are striving to live with integrity, nurture wonder, and inspire the actions that transform us and transform the world. Welcome to those of you here in this room. Welcome to those of you who are joining us in our online sanctuary. Welcome to everyone who has taken this time on this morning to nurture your spirit in community. It's wonderful to be together. I'm the Reverend Julia Hamilton, and I'm joined this morning by Angie swanson Kiriako, uh, by some wonderful singers, by all of you who are here together uh, to build a better world world together. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors or guests we have joining us, whether you're joining us here or online. We would love to get to know you better, so if you want to stop by our welcome table or stick around for our virtual coffee hour and sign our virtual guest book, ask any questions you like, we would love to get to know you and help you get to know us. And there's all kinds of things going on in this community beyond Sunday morning, so I want to highlight a few things that are coming up. Next Sunday, we are going to be celebrating the end of our spring stewardship pledge drive and we're going to have fabulous music from Glenda Sari Jam during the court in the courtyard. We're going to try to find a way to move the cameras out there so if you're joining us online you can still enjoy the music. We'll have cake. If you're online you'll have to bring your own cake however. Um, it should be a good time to celebrate. <laughs> It should be a good time to celebrate the generosity of this community that makes all of this possible. So join us on the 15th. Uh, the Sunday after that, we are going to have our town hall meeting in preparation for our annual meeting on the first Sunday in June. This is when we exercise our democratic voice as a congregation. So mark your calendars for that first Sunday in June uh, for our annual meeting. And if you have any questions about that, you can show up at the town hall meeting on the 22nd. We are, of course, also beginning our conversation around adding an eighth principle to Unitarian Universalism, um, identifying anti-racism work, uh, and moving toward the beloved community as a spiritual practice. And there's a table out in the courtyard and a conversation with members of our board of trustees and our anti-racism commission. If you have any questions about that process, uh, you can visit the table out in the courtyard. We are still meeting on Wednesday evenings for our uh, climate change group that's talking about all of the grief and feelings and ways we can move forward through those uh, moments of despair into action around the climate crisis. So if you've been feeling sort of down about the future of our planet. Don't stay there, come and join other folks to strategize and work through that so that we can move towards the healing of our world together. I would like everyone to take a breath or settle yourself where you are. Set aside whatever to-do lists you have waiting for you out in the world. Allow yourself to be fully present to this time and place, to this community, as we ring our bell and let the sound connect us. If you have a chalice at home or a candle to light at home, now is the time to kindle that flame with us as we light our chalice here together. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community and to each other. Every Sunday, we also take a moment after we light our chalice to remind us that despite all of the bad news, there's always good news too, alongside people working to build more love and justice in the world. And we call this our hope jar this year, our virtual hope jar. So take a moment, and if you can think of something that's brought you hope, that's inspired you, that's opened your heart, if you're joining us online, you can type it in the chat. If you're here in this room, you can share it with each other over coffee or tea and conversation after the service. And for our virtual hope jar, I want to offer up a very concrete opportunity to build hope after a very difficult week. And that is this Saturday, there is going to be 
uh, Santa Barbara is participating in the nationwide rallies for reproductive justice at noon in De La Guerra Plaza. So if you're looking for hope, this is the place to go to be with other people who are committed to working for reproductive justice in the world, uh, to meet new people, to meet a new generation of activists that are going to be born in this struggle. So Saturday, uh, at De La Guerra Plaza at noon, and there's going to be a sign-making party in Parish Hall on Tuesday from 3 to 6. So if you want to get ready uh, and join together with our justice and equity team, uh, show up here on Tuesday afternoon, make some signs, and join us for this collective expression of, um, of the, our commitment to working for reproductive justice for everyone. Uh, and it, it really does uh, inspire me and bring me hope, and I hope it does for you too. Let us now sing together our opening hymn. As we sing hymn 318, we would be one. We would be one as now we join in singing a hymn of love to play. Ourselves anew to that high cause of greater understanding of who we are and what in us is true. So this is the time when we tell stories that are for all ages because people of all ages love a good story. So if anybody who wants to hear a good story wants to come and join me up on the carpet or you can stay where you are. Um, this morning's story, as Angie and I were working on this service, we wanted to represent a, a really a diverse experience of mothering and motherhood and honor all of the different ways we're in relationship with the idea of motherhood because this is Mother's Day. And we were talking, and I asked Angie if there was any good books or stories about someone who had adopted parents but was still in contact with their birth mother, because that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today. And so we talked about it, and, and she thought about it and said, you know, I don't really know of a great kid's story that tells that story. So then we said, well, why don't we write one? <laughs> so we did, and this is our story. Sometimes you have to write the stories you can't find out there in the world. Hi, my name is Sam, and I have two moms. Not like Yolanda, who has two moms who are married to each other and they all live in the same house. I have my mom and dad who I live with, who adopted me when I was a baby, and I also have Katie. Katie gave birth to me, but lives in a different house in a city about two hours away from where I live. Every month, Katie comes up to my town and we do something fun. 
Sometimes it's ice cream at the beach. Sometimes we go bowling. Sometimes she comes up to watch my soccer match if I have a game on that weekend. My best friend Ricardo is also adopted, and he has two dads, but he never gets to see his birth mom. He was born in Guatemala, which is really far away. Sometimes he wonders about her, about who she was and where she lives. His dads have some photographs they gave him and a letter she wrote to him when he was a baby, and he keeps them in the top drawer of his dresser. He showed them to me once when I had a sleepover at his house. I met Ricardo at the Unitarian Universalist Church where we both go on Sundays. And when we found out that we were both adopted, we became best friends right away. Not everyone understands me like he does. Today is Mother's Day. So after I go to church with my mom and dad, Katie picks me up and we go to the zoo. I ask if Ricardo can come along with us since he's already at church with me on Sundays, and Katie thinks that's a great idea, so we bring him too. And when we get to the zoo, because it's Mother's Day, they have signs up on a lot of the exhibits telling us about all the different kinds of animals and the kinds of families that animals have. I guess humans aren't the only ones who have lots of ways to raise their kids. Do you know that flamingo parents can tell the squawking of their babies from all the other baby flamingos, and that's how they know which ones to feed? There were lots of flamingos and flamingo babies at the zoo, and they all sounded the same to me but I guess maybe you have to be a flamingo to understand. (laughs) Alligator moms carry their babies in their mouth and take care of them for a long time, unlike most other reptiles who don't pay much attention after the eggs are hatched. I'm kind of glad I'm not an alligator baby because I bet their mom's breath smells like fish. (laughs) And I'd be very worried about accidentally getting crushed by those teeth. Next, we saw a sign that said elephants are pregnant for two whole years. Katie laughs and wonders if the elephants ever get morning sickness. She tells me that she threw up every morning for three months when she was pregnant with me. She says the only thing she wanted to eat was bananas and crackers. This reminds us that we're all hungry, so we stop and get frozen bananas dipped in chocolate, which are my favorite treat at the zoo. Next, we see the penguin pool where the keepers tell us that some penguins adopt babies and that there are two male penguins who formed a pair and sometimes the keepers will give them an egg and they will sit on the egg and raise the baby chick together. Ricardo declares that penguins are his new favorite animal and the next time he is at the zoo with his dads, he's going to ask for one of those giant stuffed penguins in the gift shop. After the penguins, Ricardo wants to go into the spider house where they have all the insects but I tell him I'll wait outside. I'm not a big fan of insects, especially in dark places. He comes running out to tell me that a mother spider can have hundreds of babies at once, and then the babies all float away on the wind using silk thread like kites. I wonder if it's like the hang gliders we see at the beach, and I jokingly ask Ricardo if he traveled on the wind when he was a baby. He snorts with laughter at the idea and tells me that he thinks he arrived on a plane. I've never been on a plane, so I ask him what it's like, but he was too little to remember. Katie says it's time to go home, and since we can't spin a thread and float away like spider babies, we'll have to take the car. We drop Ricardo off at his house, and then Katie brings me home. She waves to my parents and gives me a big hug and tells me she'll see me next month. The fair is coming to town, and we both love the spinny rides. This ends our story this morning. Let us sing our children to their activities together.
There are so many stories of generosity in this congregation and so many people who help make this congregation what it is. Uh, and I would like to invite one of those people to come forward. Goon Dukes uh, is part of our stewardship team and sings in the choir and does so many other things around here. Um, and I would like to invite her to speak on generosity in our community this morning. Thank you, Julia. Do you remember what it felt like to find a religious home, a loving community where your mind is respected, your spirit is encouraged, and your whole self is welcomed, celebrated, and loved? I wish that those were my words, but they're Reverend Julius from the cover letter that came with your pledging material. I very well remember my very first visit to the USSB, which was for a service celebrated by the coming of age youth. It was amazing. The kids were astounding. And it was not any kind of church that I'd ever been to. And so I knew this was my home. And 20 years later, here I am. I'm still here, and so are you. Here we are, together in person. When I look out at you again, I realize again how much I have missed our being together here in the sanctuary. I feel great joy and gratitude that we have come together through these disastrous years, and I'm confident that we can handle whatever might come next. Just like Reverend Julia and volunteers and staff handled crafting a brand new way to celebrate with the congregation through Zoom. Reverend Julia's sermons broke through my isolation and helped me stay strong during the week. And then next Sunday, there was another sermon to fill me up again. Maybe you've had the same experience. And wasn't it interesting to see how the other Unitarian churches in our district, when the services were combined, and experience that glorious diversity of music that we could hear while our choir was inactive. When we were finally able to start up the choir practice, we were in the courtyard in heavy coats, hats, gloves, choir masks, and book lights so that we could read the music as darkness fell. But we were not to be deterred and our huge gratitude goes to Deb, Deb Snow, who awakened our joy in singing. And with Matthew's arrival, the choir was able to sing at the Christmas mass services, at the Christmas services. Remember, remember, we had a real Christmas music. It was a Christmas miracle as far as I'm concerned, and we needed it so badly. Now the choir practices in Parish Hall, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to wake up our voices with Matthew's help. Speaking of waking up, wasn't it very fun to have the drummer group join us in the recent service? Didn't you love the different drums and our congregants going at it with their drums? Another opportunity for community at USSB. Now I'm grateful for the community of connection circles and the volunteers who put them all together. Those of you who have experienced connection circles know how strong the bond between participants become. And let's not forget about the connection through the auction. Or there events offered in the fall are now going on. Taco Tuesday, Primo Pizza, pedicure and luncheon, don't ask generous event offerings and the financial support that the winning bids provide the church. So I'm so grateful that I found the church through the Coming of Age program. And the ton, a ton of gratitude goes to the members who currently mentor the group that I understand where the, the, have the youngsters that are exceptional. I hear the best ever. So don't miss their youth-led service on May 22nd, and maybe bring a friend. 
like Reverend Julia says at the opening of each service, there is a lot going on, and your generosity makes it all happen, brings our community to, to life, keeping the congregation healthy and vibrant. If you've already submitted your pledge to support, we thank you, and if you are still deciding, I hope my words today will inspire your generosity. Thank you. Coming of age services in two weeks on the 22nd. You won't want to miss it. On this Mother's Day, let us mark how beautiful and complex our relationship to motherhood can be. It is an embodied reality that each of us exists because someone mothered us in one way or another. Motherhood is not just a sentimental, made-for-TV, hallmark storyline to be celebrated once a year with brunch and flowers. Rather, our relationship with mothering contains the potential for the most meaningful and also some of the most painful experiences of our lives. The stories and experiences of our relationship with motherhood are as diverse as the people joining us in this sanctuary. As a congregation, we strive to make room for all of our stories, to expand our compassion to include all the joys and sorrows that come with being beautifully and imperfectly human, born and raised by other imperfect humans. This can be a difficult day for many. It can be a day of contradictions. It can be a day of joy. There is space here for all of it. In a moment, Angie and I are going to drop stones into water in this bowl to name and bless some of the ways that we experience motherhood. This is the same bowl that we use each year during our water ceremony, our in-gathering, the bowl that symbolically holds all of the stories and life experiences when we come and pour our water each fall into it together. And after the service this morning, you are welcome to come up to this altar and add your own stole to this bowl, stone to this bowl as well. As we begin to drop these stones, and Angie, if you'd like to join me up here, As we begin to drop these stones, I invite you to settle into a comfortable posture, to breathe into that space of compassion and open-hearted acceptance of yourself and one another. You may feel moved to put a hand over your heart or hold your hands open in your lap or hold the hand of someone nearby. You can close your eyes if you wish or soften your gaze or focus on the flame of the chalice or the sounds of the stones as they fall. Although most mothers are women, motherhood and mothering can be done by people of all genders. And so to all of those of you who have lovingly mothered others in your beautiful diversity, we bless you. To those who are in the thick of raising and nurturing children of any age, we see your hard work and we bless you. To those whose experiences of motherhood is intertwined with loss, estrangement, or alienation. We make space for your grief and we bless you. To those who have mourned their mothers and other figures who have gone from this life to join the ancestors, we remember with you and we bless you. To those who have encountered violence where there should have been tenderness and care, who have endured abuse by the person mothering them, we hold hope for your healing, and we bless you. To those who carry guilt or shame about being a not good enough mother or are working towards repair and healing, we support you and we bless you. 
to those who have experienced the pain of infertility, miscarriage, and stillbirth, and whose stories are too often held in silence, we see you and we bless you. To those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate we with you and we bless you. To those who have embraced non-traditional parenting and family structures, who have thrown open their hearts to children in need of love, and have sought the recognition of the right to mother, we embrace you and we bless you. To those who are single moms, grandmoms, stepmoms, foster moms, adoptive moms, mentor moms, birth moms, and spiritual moms, we cherish you and we bless you. I'll close this ritual by pouring into this bowl water from our ingathering water ceremony. This is the water that we bring each September, gathering the waters of our community as a symbol of how we come together as a congregation. We purify this water, and then we use it in our child dedications throughout the year. It seems fitting that we add some of this water symbolizing our community, symbolizing our connection to our ancestors as well as future generations. It seems fitting that we use this water to bless all the stories of motherhood among us today. We are a community strong enough, brave enough, and loving enough to hold the diversity among us with tenderness and care. As the water has poured into this bowl, may this ritual remind us that we do not travel alone, but are carried in a river of love and compassion with companions who see us, love us, help us heal, celebrate, and grow so that we all may survive and thrive together. Blessings on this Mother's Day, one and all. May it be so, blessed be, and amen. Every month at the Unitarian Society, we partner with a project or a program that lives our values in the world. And this month, we're partnering with the Santa Barbara Audubon Society, helping us cherish the beauty that we find in the birds and nature all around us. Please read with me the affirmation of gratitude and giving. It should be on the screen in front of you. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. And let us be grateful even for our needs so that we may learn from the generosity of others.
Thank you, singers and musicians. We're going to keep on till we find it. In 1994, a group of black women gathered in Chicago to prepare for the International Conference on Population and Development. It was at this gathering that they crafted a vision for reproductive justice that inspired a new generation. A generation longing for a conversation that was about more than just choice. Reproductive justice is broader. It is the human right to maintain bodily, personal autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. When I asked Angie several months ago to share her story and work with me on the service this morning, I had the framework of reproductive justice in mind. I knew that we needed to hear all of the diverse stories in our midst so that we could open our hearts and expand our understanding to become the truly inclusive and welcoming and justice-seeking religious home that I know we want to be. I had no idea that this Sunday, would include the devastating news that we are on the brink of overturning Roe and stripping reproductive rights away from half of the country. It is more important than ever that this congregation lives into our promise of being a place where the worth and dignity of all people are honored, which, uphold, which includes upholding the right to self-determination when it comes to reproductive choices. 
Angie's story of relinquishing a child to adoption, which you will hear more about in a moment, is just one person's story, but it highlights how complex and intimate these decisions are. We live in a society that often idealizes adoption, especially when it involves photogenic, white, heteronormative adoptive parents. Adoption is often portrayed as an easy solution to the problem of unwanted pregnancies, and so-called crisis pregnancy centers that seek to coerce and shame people away from abortion often push adoption as a deceptively simple process. We have many adoptive parents and children in our congregation who know firsthand the challenges and joys and complexities of this path. We also have birth parents in the congregation whose story is less visible and less often told. We affirm that adoption is one choice when it comes to raising a family, but it should never be the only choice or a coerced choice. So I want to thank Angie for trusting us with her story today. Let us listen with open hearts and minds. And after the service, if this brings up difficult parts of your own history, I will be staying here in the sanctuary with members of our pastoral care team to form a small circle for anyone who needs pastoral care and support on this day. Angie. Good morning, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here with you on this day where we in the United States celebrate Mother's Day. For so many, this is a celebratory day to honor one's mother or mother figure, or perhaps a self-celebration of one's own motherhood. I most definitely believe mothers should be celebrated because it can be incredibly difficult to be a mother in a society that puts enormous pressures on moms to do it all, have it all, but with hefty doses of mom shaming and little appreciation. On this Mother's Day, I want to talk to you about my own experience with motherhood and the complications and problems that historically and presently exist with adoption that should be acknowledged at a time when we are reckoning with problems of gender, bodily autonomy, race, class, and privilege. Further complicating matters, since I began writing this reflection, we have learned that there is a Supreme Court majority opinion which will overturn, sometime this summer, the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion in the United States. What it means to be a mother, and even the decision of whether or not to become a mother, is in the process of being transformed in a way that several generations of women and birthing people grew up never having to think about. Back in December 2021, when the case Dobbs versus Jackson's Women Health Organization was heard at the Supreme Court, a mother on that court, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, remarked that there wasn't a need for abortion because adoption removes the burden of parenthood. This idea ignores the emotional and mental burden a person experiences when they relinquish a child for adoption. Most of us have been taught that adoption is an act of love, but we now stand at the precipice of having thousands or even millions of women for whom it will become an act of legal necessity. But setting aside the new political, moral, and legal context for a few moments, let me ask each of you, how much thought is given to everyone in adoption. So often we hear about the couple or individual who wants a child and has love to give. We hear stories of children who are needy, abandoned, and impoverished. There are many reasons why someone considers adopting a child. Perhaps there have been infertility struggles. A same-sex couple sees this as the most assess accessible way to have a family. A single person may decide they no longer want to postpone parenthood just because they don't have a partner. Others may have religious beliefs that tell them it is their duty to adopt. 
For most of us, that is where our understanding of adoption begins and where it ends. But what about the birth parents? And on this last Mother's Day of choice for millions of American women, what about the birth mothers? Right now, some of you may be asking yourself, what is a birth mother? This is understandable because so often birth mothers remain unseen and their stories untold. But what about them? What are their stories? What about their rights? Today, I want to raise awareness about the women and birthing people who make every adoption possible, but who are often overlooked and disregarded once the adoption is finalized. I personally know what it feels like to be overlooked and disregarded. You see, 24 years ago, I placed my only child for adoption. For over two decades, I've been reminded repeatedly by society, the media, acquaintances, and strangers that although I gave birth, they do not see me as a mother. Before I became a birth mother in 1998, Mother's Day was already complicated for me. As a child, I endured physical, mental, and emotional abuse from my own mother. I never understood why my father tolerated this, but I suspect he thought it was easier to let the abuse continue than to have her turn her rage on him. Eventually, my father could no longer endure the marriage, and my parents divorced. Almost immediately, the material comforts of an upper-middle-class home disappeared. I have vivid memories of days without food, shoes that were too tight because there was no money for new shoes, and taking cold baths because there was no resources to replace the water heater that broke. This socioeconomic shift was, of course, difficult for my mother, and it fueled her rage, which she then directed at me. I moved out of my mother's home when I was 19 and never looked back. I knew for my own survival, I needed to not have my mother in my life. I vowed that if I were ever to become a mother, I would be nothing like her. As you can see, Mother's Day was complicated from an early start for me. When I was a teen, I would often daydream about boys and who I would marry and have children with. Unfortunately, growing up in chaos and trauma influenced the type of romantic partnerships I gravitated towards. While I didn't date a lot, I would fall into long commitments that were sometimes fun but mostly tumultuous and damaging to my self-worth and self-esteem. In these dysfunctional partnerships, I believed I was deserving of the abuse I experienced. I had no concept or framework of healthy communication or a kind, respectful love. In 1997, I thought I had met the one. Feeling directionless and hopeless in my 20s, I thought it would be wise to leave my job, my community, and my friends to move to a city I thought would bring an abundance of good fortune and success for me and my then partner. As I was preparing to move, I ignored the many red flags along the way, including the blaring flashing sirens from some of my friends who asked me repeatedly if I was sure I wanted to move. And they would ask, what do you exactly see in him? And they were concerned about me. However, I thought I was in love and had found my soulmate. It turned out I was in another toxic relationship. Within a couple of weeks of relocating to the new city, what my friends had warned me about came true. My partner was manipulative. He was physically, mentally, and financially abusive. I felt I had no control and was paralyzed with fear and shame. I was scared but I also felt very stupid that I hadn't listened to my friends. Employment was unstable for me and my partner, and soon it became a struggle to pay for rent and food. This was an incredibly stressful time, so of course I assumed the extreme fatigue, the random bouts of nausea and vomiting I was experiencing were all related to stress and anxiety. So you might be calculating these factors in your head right now. Fatigue, nausea, vomiting. Uh-oh. If your answer is, she was pregnant, you are correct. When it was confirmed that I was not suffering from the flu or a stomach bug, and that yes, I was indeed pregnant, I panicked. 
Shame, anxiety, and denial are powerful. All three had me frozen. Once I overcame these and spoke to my partner, he quickly agreed to help pay for the cost of an abortion. However, it seemed like something would always come up, and finally, when my options about my pregnancy were limited to parenting or placing my child for adoption, he exploded with anger and accused me of wanting to murder his baby. This was a vivid reminder of the many challenges that my partner and I were experiencing. The struggle to pay rent, and the day days with meals that consisted only of a couple slices of bread, me confronting him about his ex-girlfriend's number appearing multiple times on our phone bill, the sexist and belittling comments he made to me, and the elaborate lies he often told with no remorse when he was caught. My adult life looked quite a bit like my childhood. I thought about the cycles of abuse in my family. Even though I told myself I would never be like my mother, in that moment I was terrified I could never be enough for my child. I also want to mention that at that time I had been struggling with years of untreated depression and anxiety. The patriarchy, misogyny, and internalized sexism permeated my thoughts and made me think I was a bad person for becoming pregnant outside of marriage. Individually, any of those challenges I listed can cause one to feel overwhelmed. Combine them all together while being pregnant, I thought there was no other option than to place my baby for adoption. When I told my partner what I believed we needed to do, he expressed no resistance and agreed it was probably for the best. I was certain that what made someone worthy of parenting was money, a house, and marriage. That for my child to have the best possible life, I believed the most responsible and loving decision was adoption. I know there are a variety of experiences in the adoption process. It is important for me to share a portion of what I experienced as it is not uncommon to see the same tactics used today with expectant parents and birth parents. I was incredibly ignorant about adoption. Any ideas that I had were based on television, movies, and magazines. Back then, and now, the media does a horrible job of depicting birth parents or showing a variety of stories about birth mothers. Most of the time, birth mothers are shown as unbalanced and always plotting on how to steal the baby, or the birth mother is completely written out of the story through death. In the days where the internet was accessible to only a select few, I went to what seemed like a reliable source to find an adoption professional, the Yellow Pages. For those who don't know what that is, <laughs> the Yellow Pages is like a big book of printed Google searches. So I took to the Yellow Pages and searched under A for adoption. I found an adoption attorney. Being that I had never searched for any kind of attorney, what did I base my decision on? Well, nothing. Actually, his office was located in a nearby city, so maybe I chose him based on distance. My partner and I met with the attorney to discuss our situation. I don't think I was very fond of the attorney. However, I never sought a second opinion or tried to find someone else that I felt more comfortable with. So my partner and I decided we would, would, would work with the attorney we had known then for about 60 minutes. We were given several forms to review and sign to begin the adoption process. When the necessary paperwork was completed, we were given binders. Binders full of hopeful adopted parents. Again, this was the late 1990s. There was no Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, just binders. For me, pouring through those binders was daunting, confusing, peculiar, and overwhelming. Some couples wrote about how they met one another, their hobbies, where they went to college, and of course, their desire to adopt. All the letters started with, dear birth mother, even though I was still very much my child's parent at that time. I felt like a failure and a horrible person for not having similar comforts and accomplishments like the people in those binders. I think it's important to say this, that I believe all the couples in those binders were white. My former partner is Latinx. Never did it cross my mind to ask about any Latinx or Hispanic couples, nor were any presented to us. 
I bear partial responsibility for my daughter not being raised in her Latinx culture. I say partial because my former partner disappeared a few months after our daughter's first birthday, and her adoptive parents did not incorporate her culture in their home. I do recall the attorney asking me and my partner if either of us were of Native American heritage. We each said to our knowledge we were not, and the attorney's response was good. Good meant that the attorney did not have to think about the Indian Child Welfare Act, also known as ICWA. As we know, the United States has a long history of horrific crimes against indigenous people. ICWA was enacted in 1978 to protect indigenous children, giving tribal authority over the adoption of indigenous children to strengthen and protect indigenous families. It should be no surprise that the Supreme Court is currently reviewing the constitutionality of ICWA. In my situation, I cannot help but think the attorney was more concerned about impediments to the adoption process and possibly losing a client than the actual well-being of my child. My partner and I found a couple that looked nice. They were local, had two golden retrievers, traveled, and were homeowners. The husband had a prestigious career, and the wife was preparing to be a stay-at-home mother for the baby they would adopt. I should also point out that the adoptive parents and I had the same attorney. To my knowledge, there's no other type of legal transaction in California where the involved parties don't have their own representation. In my ignorance, I signed a waiver indicating I did not need my own representation. This was a huge mistake, as I, nor my baby, truly had her own advocate. To this day, dual representation is still permissible in 29 states, including California. Throughout the adoption process, the attorney would regularly let me know that the prospective adoptive parents were nervous. The attorney would make comments to me such as, the adoptive parents are worried you're changing your mind. The adoptive parents do hope you'll follow through. The adoptive parents are upset you don't want them in the delivery room. I never thought to ask why there was so much focus on the prospective adoptive parents' emotions. Why did their comfort take precedence over mine, the one who would soon be relinquishing her child? No one talked to me about parenting resources or the heartache I would experience when I would eventually watch another person walk away with my baby. The focus was reassuring the hopeful adoptive parents and easing their worries. Based on how I was feeling and my damaged self-esteem, it didn't take long for me to start putting their well-being over my own. What the attorney said to me was incredibly manipulative and not uncommon at all. In 2022, there are still adoption agencies, adoption attorneys, and crisis pregnancy centers that use coercive and simplified language to describe adoption to pregnant people. Common messaging includes repeatedly mentioning how expensive it is to raise a child, and that even though the expected parent has love, that just won't be enough. There is misinformation about the birth mother having total control over the level of openness in the adoption. This is false. Once their parental rights are terminated, the birth mother has no power. The savvier organizations will briefly touch on grief, but it's usually followed by a false reassurance that the birth mother's sadness will be fleeting when she sees how happy their child is with their adoptive family. There's a website of a crisis pregnancy center in Santa Rosa, California, that goes as far to pose the question, and I quote, did you know that women have the ability to fully actualize, reach their full potential, by completing the nine months of pregnancy while still empowering another woman with a child? This type of messaging is insulting and deceptive. It is not the responsibility of women and birthing people to remain pregnant so they can fulfill the needs of the adoption industry. Often when a person is pregnant and contemplating adoption, they are in distress. Very similar distress to what I experienced. Housing insecurity, poverty, and domestic violence. It can be very easy to convince them that they are not capable of parenting and their child would be better off with another family. 
Some expectant parents face extreme pressure from their family, the biological father, or their religious institution to relinquish their child. They may be told that if they keep their baby, they are no longer welcome in the home, or their partner threatens to leave. Perhaps they are told it is a sin to have an abortion, but they are selfish if they want to keep their child. Now that I'm 20 plus years out from the adoption, I can see much more clearly what happened to me. I share this because the same situations are happening now to women and birthing people, and I'm deeply concerned of what the younger generation will face if they do not have full control over their reproductive health. We know that girls and women are still shamed for their sexuality. There are school districts across the United States where sex education is abstinence only. Access to birth control can be limited depending on where one lives and the cost. We also know that birth control, no matter how diligently used, can fail. We have political candidates and leaders in our country who have no compassion for vict victims of sexual assault, think bodies shut down during rape, and that people should be expected to continue with any pregnancy that results from this violence. These scenarios are not uncommon and can cause an expectant parent to feel desperate, unsupported, judged, and hopeless. Adoption really isn't a choice when all your options and dignity have been taken away. It's important to note that not all unplanned pregnancies are unwanted pregnancies. Many birth mothers frantically try to find a way to parent their baby, but are often left with little to no resources or support. For those who decide to place their child for adoption or feel that they have no choice, even if it is just a small percentage of people, they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. They need their own advocate who does not have a financial stake in whether or not the adoption is finalized. They deserve to know that the grief of placing a child for adoption lasts a lifetime and they may feel extreme shame and guilt. It may impact their mental health and self-esteem and it will be very difficult to find others that will honor their unique disenfranchised grief and ambiguous loss. There will be moments when they feel forgotten, isolated and alone and for some, they may feel suicidal. I know this all too well when I arrived home without my baby, the heartache was immeasurable. I sobbed uncontrollably and contemplated suicide because I couldn't imagine spending the rest of my life without my child and in so much anguish. My life did not magically transform by relinquishing my child. In fact, it got much worse. Within that first year, I was evicted from my home. My car was repossessed. I was struggling to find employment, and the birth father became even more controlling and abusive. However, I am grateful that I had access to a therapist during that first year post-placement. To this day, I believe my life was saved by that therapist and two dear friends who helped me break away from the birth father. I also have to give myself credit for surviving and being resilient and tenacious, believing that one day I would see my daughter again. In that regard, I was fortunate. Most birth mothers are left to navigate post-placement life on their own, again, without any support, community, or knowledge of their existence. I'm happy to share that I've been in reunion with my daughter for the past 10 years. I'm so grateful to see her grow into a smart, compassionate, independent, and caring young adult. While I cherish every visit, conversation, and text with my daughter, I also grieve for what I missed out on, for what we both missed out on. Adoption is complicated. Adoption is a paradox. Adoption is full of the both and. This past Monday, as I read the leaked draft opinion from the Supreme Court, my stomach churning and my palms clammy, I thought about the birth mothers who relinquished the decades before Roe, between 1945 to 1972, a time referred to as the baby scoop era, over one million pregnant girls and women in the United States were sent away to maternity homes to give birth under secrecy, shame, and in some instances, abuse at the hands of those who ran the homes. Many of these women were forced to sign relinquishment papers while heavily medicated 
or were threatened with jail or financial penalties if they did not give up their child. Some of these mothers did not get to hold their babies, know whether they had a boy or a girl, and in some cases were lied to and told their baby had died. They all heard the same hollow phrases that they should just move on, that they would forget it ever happened, and that it was for the best. On this day, I do want to acknowledge and honor all forms of motherhood. I extend comfort and compassion to those whom motherhood seems unattainable. I walk with those whose relationships with their mothers are fractured or non-existent. I give my condolences to those who are grieving the loss of their mother and st strength to those whose mother is ill. There is so much more to share about my personal experience the experiences of birth mothers, and why adoption is not a simple solution for an unintended pregnancy. I could talk for hours. Since I don't have hours, and I'm certain you have other things you'd like to do today, I ask that when you leave here, you consider the nuances of adoption. If your family was formed by adoption, consider how society thinks or doesn't think about your child's birth mother. If you're in a discussion with someone who oversimplifies adoption and safe haven laws like Justice Barrett did, maybe you'll remember some of what I said today and provide some insights on the experiences of birth mothers. And finally, if you are a birth mother, please know that I'm here if you need comfort, if you need someone to listen to your story, or support coming out of the shadows. You are not alone. Thank you. Let us sing our closing hymn together. Let us embrace a community of both and. Let us sing together about how we travel without always knowing everything about the journey. And we do it in solidarity with joy and compassion. <laughs> All right.
you guys can take your seats or you can stay right there, whichever you prefer. And I'd like to invite everyone to rise in body or spirit, wherever you are, whether you're here in this room or joining us online, if you want to put your hands over your heart or hold your hands open or hold the hand of someone near you with their permission. As we move out into this beautiful and heartbreaking world, holding with us all of the joys and complexities of this life. May the light of love shine upon you, out from within you, be gracious unto you, and bring you peace. For this is the day we are given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let us call out a blessing. and we will be gathering in the sanctuary in just a few minutes if you would like to gather in a small pastoral space together. Otherwise, enjoy coffee hour. Thanks.